25th. These are guys you might have taken basic with at Fort Benning or Davis or Devons or Dix. They were in Paris on August 25th. Paris, France, with a big underline for the word France. Because this old fellow, her, him, had been walking around the streets for four years in Paris, Germany, sleepwalking in a kind of German nightmare. Now it belonged to them again. G.I. Joe and his big tank and his little jeep and his dirty pants was lucky enough to be there to get some dividends from the way they felt about it. Like that. It wasn't new to the Yanks. They'd been in France a couple of months already. But just the same, it was very pleasant to be around when liberation came to Paris. Yeah, the kisses, the yelling, the waving, the sheepish G.I. grins of what it looks like, this business of liberation. Oh la la, the American magnifique. The wonderful American. But you can't just look at scenes like this and say that's what liberation is. You can't look at the simple, wonderful joy in Paris in August 1944 and forget what came before or what must come after. Freedom can write its name into walls and floors in the lap of a young Parisian. But it's a lot more serious than it looks. Because freedom is history. And strangely enough, a lot of the history of freedom comes from Paris. Let's go back a ways. This is Paris before anyone but Germany was thinking about war. Eiffel Tower, champagne a buck a bottle, Holy Berger, and you know what. That's what people said about her. Sidewalk cafes in the artist sections, where you sip wine for five francs a bottle and look twice at the French girls on the boulevards. Nightclubs where you saw things you'd never see again or tell about. Very wow, where a man can have the best time in the world. But that's not Paris. To Frenchmen, it was a different thing. To Frenchmen, Paris was all and none of France, gloriously and imperishably symbolic of French simplicity and dignity. The lovely green of the Champs Elysees, the simple, quiet beauty of the Madeleine of Saint Chapelle and Notre Dame. Paris was the grace of France, all wrapped up in the cracks and cobblestones and spires and smells and sounds of one of the oldest cities on the continent. But even Paris in stone isn't Paris. To history, Paris is an ancient city where men first began to get up on their feet and talk about the rights of human beings. To history, the cockeyed old streets and alleyways are alive, with plain men beginning to talk of liberty and fraternity. In 1789, a ragged bunch of Frenchmen who believed in freedom fought and earned the right to have the democratic world rescue their great-grandchildren in 1944. Because history plays tricks, whatever the reverse of liberation is, it looked like this on a bright June day in 1940. Germans went into Paris, and Paris went into nightmare. The faces of Paris shut up, and the shutters of Paris closed. And inside France, Frenchmen fought and waited in the only way they could. One June day over radios, which were death to own, they heard the voice of an American, Eisenhower from London. June 6th, 1944. Back in the secret headquarters of the Paris underground, the men and women of the French forces of the interior, who for four years had played a game of deadly hide and seek with the Germans, knew the time was close for them to come out from the dark into the sun. Get out the grenades, check the guns, wear the badge of freedom. The German 7th Army is trapped at Palais. Paris waited, quiet. Then, the bakers and plumbers and shoe clerks and their wives struck. And as they went into the streets to build once more the barricades their fathers and grandfathers had built against the enemy, their national anthem, the Marseillaise, beat through their hearts. 
Yeah, history plays tricks. These were the same Paris streets that song had been born in. In these buildings were bullet holes 150 years old. Paris had declared war again. And Paris cut down her trees and ripped up her pavements, remembering these words. Come on, you sons of your country. The day of glory has arrived. The enemy is tyranny. Let's raise our flag in blood against him. Come, citizens of France. Form we will march. Some will shed blood and lose their lives. They marched. And they shed blood. They lost their lives. It was war between the German army and the citizens of Paris. German tanks roamed the streets, shooting up the town. But mainly it was guerrilla warfare, sniper against sniper. Familiar streets suddenly as hot with bullets as a border town. Guns dug out of the backyard, bombs dished up by the corner druggist. Housewives and kids suddenly caught in a crossfire. Blood and death, a splatter of bullets. The Germans were finding out that the city of Champagne and sidewalk cafes was tough. For five days and five nights it lasted. The citizens of Paris needed help. It came. Frenchmen who four years before had joined de Gaulle in England and in Africa had been moving with the Americans and were on the fringes of their beloved Paris. On the sixth day of the bitter fight in Paris, they cracked the Nazi lines south of the city and they were in Paris. Twisted cockeyed barriers from behind which the valiant FFI had held the Germans for so many days with single-shot rifles and hunting pistols and museum pieces were pulled aside to let the armor through. Frenchmen and G.I. Joes in tanks rolled under the Eiffel Tower. And for Germans, the Paris incident was over, except for a desperate last-ditch fight. Paris, too, the incident was over. And freedom had come back in the form of a new Nazi salute. In a few hours' time, the Aryan conquerors, the arrogant men who ruled by terror and distrust, had melted into frightened men in the wrong country with soiled uniforms and shaky knees. The muscle men who had liked to goose step across the face of their Europe in shiny boots and the double time it down a Paris alleyway to keep from getting balled out by a skinny French civilian wearing a dirty armband. Yeah, for the Germans, with their hands held in the air, history had backfired. For Paris, history had just repeated itself. The city of gaiety and stone and history belonged again to Frenchmen, while the conquerors were herded off to eat soup out of tin buckets in prison camps.
Under the Arc de Triomphe, General de Gaulle paid the first tribute in four years to the unknown soldier of the French Republic. A living man was honoring the dead of France once more in a living city. Yes, sir, liberation looks like this. The shutters and the heart of Paris opened suddenly into the sunlight, flooded over the boulevards and squares like a tidal wave. The words they used and the names they shouted don't count, even if they could have been understood. Freedom to live again was just there in a crazy mass. This was Paris again, after four years of a foul dream. Ask a Paris waiter what it means, this business of being free again. Ask her what it's worth. Ike Eisenhower and Omar Bradley knew the cost of liberation and saw its worth that August day in Paris. But Paris will not be liberated into a world of peace until Nanking and Manila look like this. The free men of the earth can live together without guns. For it's one war. No part of it is unimportant or forgotten. Americans have always been famous for their marksmanship. In past wars, we have always shot straighter, faster, and harder than the enemy. Never has that tradition been more splendidly illustrated than today. Your Navy's gunners are the finest in the world, as the mounting toll of Jap ships and aircraft testifies. These gun crews, all of them, have a single aim in view to send to the bottom every Jap ship on the seas and every Jap plane in the air, to silence every Jap shore battery between us and Tokyo. Every naval air gunner has the same aim for every Jap plane in his sights. They can do it, too, if you shoot straight with them. See that they get all the ammunition they need through your work and your savings. Show the world that every American shoots straight and hard. 